Hello and welcome to this session. Um, this week's um, uh, podcast is entitled Fibre 101, what every broadcast uh, engineer or media technician needs to know. And I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, my good friend and industry colleague, Mr. Hugh Waters, who you can see in the, the Skype window above me there. And uh, our plan this week is just, uh, you know, as ever, uh, for Hugh to be the, uh, the wise, sagely head who will um, pick up on any mistakes I make or, 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 or any, any things that I, I sort of uh, dash through too quickly for them to be understandable and and hopefully you know he won't have to interrupt too often uh, but um just uh, r really uh to, to, to introduce you and and just get you to say a few things about yourself Hugh. i'm gonna stick your okay. web page up so everybody can see what you're about and and, and what you do okay yeah um well i i'm a consultant i work entirely on my own for other people now but i used to run a company called Molyneux, which is a big post house in uh, Soho in London and uh, I was technical director before that and chief engineer before that and I used to run a uh, be a chief engineer at a, a little company called Telecine as well which if you're old enough you might just remember but uh, it got swallowed up by the big American conglomerates years ago but uh, yes this is now my 10th year of being out on my own and uh, and I used to have a full head of hair <laughs> before Fun. <laughs> Fantastic, fine, fine facilities as well. So uh, we're, in, yeah. we're in we're in very good company. Um, so so yeah, we're we're talking about um, uh, fiber optics this week, and 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 uh, you know n nobody who works in the industry c could could have failed to have have, have spotted that um, uh, you know fibers making inroads into all areas uh, where previously we would we would have expected to use copper cabling. Um, uh, coaxial cabling for video, twisted pair cabling for data. Um, uh, Fibre is, is, is encroaching in our world very much. And, and the thing I notice when, when, when going around facilities, uh, quote, quoting for machine room builds and the like, is that uh, with the best will in the world, and, and with some very good engineers to talk to, not a lot of people really understand some of these fundamentals of fibre, you know, the difference between multi-mode fibre and single-mode fibre, the difference between OM3, OM1, um, and, and, and the other standards that we, 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 we find ourselves faced with now as broadcast engineers. Um, so, so I suppose the first question I really wanted to address was why? Why, why, why do we need to send... Um, uh, signals, uh, be they uh, data type signals, or or be, or be they uh, video essence, um, uh, down fiber optic cables. What what are the advantages of, of sending them down glass fiber cable rather than down um, copper cable? And if we kind of think about uh, some of the applications, like SAN traffic for shared storage systems, um, uh, you know Apple's XSAN, well now now late lamented XSAN, um, uh, Avid's Avid's Unity uh, shared storage system, um, uh, DVS, and all the other variations of, of the SNFS type distributed and shared file systems. Um, that's one a very pertinent um, and probably the first example of, of fiber optic cabling in television facilities. Um, and increasingly network traffic, uh, the kind of TCP IP traffic that goes between workstations and servers and, uh, and other equipment, that's increasingly going down fiber. And um, video, um, for a long time, outside broadcast, particularly as, as, as high definition cameras have become the norm, and particularly as outside broadcast um, will tend to have cameras maybe a kilometre or more away from the scanner on big sports events like golf and things like that. Uh, fibres become essential for getting those pictures back to the scanner. And, and even in facilities now, even modest sized facilities, because of the, um, the growth of 3G uh, high definition video, 3 gigabits per second, yeah. um, we find ourselves in a situation where all these things are, are better passed down glass fibre cable than they are down copper cable. Um, and really kind of finishing up, I suppose, with, with DVI, HDMI, and the other more contemporary uh, graphics and display type standards, which don't go down copper cable very far at all. Um, so uh, those, th those, I suppose, are the technical reasons why, why fibre is now with us and, and, and why you know, all broadcast engineers have a, a responsibility to know about these things and to, and to know what style of fibre they need and what are the differences and all those kind of things. And uh, you know, how to go about it when designing a facility, when maintaining a facility, when thinking about how you're going to configure your studio or your post-production area um, or your outside broadcast conf configuration. Indeed, uh, and, and there, there, there's actually just springs to mind a, a use for fibre which um, wasn't dictated by what I had to to transmit. It wasn't because I had to, uh, to use it. I could have used a long length of uh, coax. It was a, a feed from a, an exciter to a, a transmitter um, up a building, but the building didn't belong to the uh, to the company. They only had one floor of it. We didn't know what on earth might be going up those rises all the way to the top. Um, especially as it was probably near the lift shaft. So I just used it as 
much as anything else to simplify life so there were no electrical hums or anything it was just a very a very clean electrical separation as well as anything else so it's not just about what goes into it it's also why you might want to use something which is effectively a lovely insulator well that's that's very pertinent because um uh, w- when when you've got the trouble of induced earth currents and and other things that travel down the the, the screen of a coax cable and and mess up the signal that's being transmitted so hum bars or or nowadays uh, corruption on a digital data stream you're absolutely right Hugh um fiber optic cable is, is immune from all that you can you can have huge amounts of uh, elect- electromagnetic induced um noise running next to a fiber and it doesn't care because it's traveling as light down a down a tiny glass pipe and 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 you're free of that. Um, the other thing, that, that, that the other advantage that fibre brings, particularly for people like the defence industry, is it's very hard to intercept um, the signal going down a fibre cable. Um, you don't have to do very much to totally destroy it and for it to be detectable at either end. So, uh, you know, that, that's why the MOD, for example, was a very early adopter of fibre optic technology. Uh, uh, yes, because yes. You know, it was ruinously expensive, uh, you know, way back away when in the 70s, and the 80s, and the 90s. Uh, but uh, it suited their purposes because it was almost untappable. And even if it was tapped, it was quite easy to de- detect that the, the, the cable was being tapped. Um, so I really, I suppose I wanted to kick off... The, 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 the sort of the numbers and the nitty gritty detail of, of the fundamental differences between single mode and multi mode fiber. That's, a, that's an expression that, that uh, you hear. Well, yes. Um, I, I just thought I, I'd dig out my piece of fiber optic, which I don't know what it is. Here it is. Uh, you can probably see there's a, a little spot there. Oh, I, there's a I light going down. Box. <laughs> <laughs> that's an ADAC a, cable, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, it's a little audio cable. I've never actually had two pieces of equipment that need it, but uh, I've got it. <laughs> well, so what is that? Is that is that going to be multi-mode? Well, it's oh, only got one light pipe, so perhaps it's only single mode. What's well, the difference? No, no, no. Tell I mean, me um, ADAT used for, 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 for a relatively low data rate audio um, uh, data. It's, it's basically it's SPDIF going down a fiber. Um, uh, because it has a domestic application, that's actually a, a plastic cable. It's actually a plastic fibre. It's not an optical, a glass optical fibre at all. Uh, and so they don't go very far, and they don't sustain very high data rates. But for what they're used for, for connecting your AV receiver to your television or your hi-fi amp, they're perfect. You know, but it's just a very low data rate. Typically, I think 2.8 megabits per second, um, and probably the very poor low-end cousin of the kind of fibre we're going to talk about this evening. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Off it goes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, single mode fiber um, was w- w- what really started it all off in the 1960s. I have a friend who who, who worked for um, the post office in the 1960s when they were researching this idea of being able to push data down down glass fiber, and um, the big breakthrough came when they f- realised that if you if you doped the glass, um, the, this very pure sil- silica glass, if you doped it with germanium. That gave the, the glass just the right characteristics for containing a, a beam of light. Now, um, the, uh, this, this little diagram that I've had up for a while uh, shows, hopefully, the fundamental differences between a single-mode fibre and a multi-mode fibre. So to give you, you often hear people say, oh, it's a fibre optic cable, it's the width of a human hair, and, and you know, whatever that means. <laughs> but basically, all, all fibre that we ever deal with day to day has a, a, a diameter across the entire construction of about 125 microns, 125 millionths of a meter, from from the you know, is, is is the diameter of that of that piece of glass fiber. Now, the way single mode and multi mode differ from each other is that a single mode cable has a tiny, tiny little transparent light pipe going down the middle of it, typically nine microns. Well, that's the specification, nine microns. Um, and whereas a multi mode cable has a very, very fat, by comparison. Um, light pipe going down the middle of it and that will typically be well in, in, in recent years it would have been 62 and a half microns uh, but nowadays every, all the contemporary standards are 50 microns so 50 millionths of a meter which this obviously this so, let, this diagram is hideously just... um y- you know it emphasizes it because because if that's 125 microns then 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 you know the inner is is clearly not only half but that's the principle that, that, that a multi-mode fiber has a much much fatter center core whereas a single mode fiber has a much thinner center core Okay, yes. So uh, you mentioned 62.5 and you mentioned 50 and you said it's now more or less all 50. Uh, d- why Why was there a change? Well, and let's, let, it's well, partly let's, because they were using more glass. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let, well, the, the fact of the matter is you use exactly the same amount of glass. It's how you treat the glass when, in the manufacture. And although it's not hugely technical, um, I, I've uploaded a little clip 
to YouTube, um, which I'm just sort of showing a still from here, which I'll, I'll put the URL up so people can have a look at it if they want. And it's basically, it's a little um, five minute piece from one of those sort of popular science shows. And it's, it's, it's how fiber optic cables made. And it's very interesting, actually. So it, it's, it's, it's worth a check Oh, I, out. I watched it. Yes. Yes. Oh, you've seen that already. It's dripping. Yeah, yes. yeah, the way, the way it's drawn out, it's it's kind of interesting, isn't it? But um, so, so so getting back to our single mode fiber, the single mode fiber is a very 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 thin center trans transmissive core down the middle, about nine microns wide, and the effect of that is that it contains the beam of light perfectly. So that coherent laser light, um, where the entire wavefront is coherent, so that it's 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 a it's a pure wavefront of 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 um, of light uh, frequency traveling down that 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 sense coin and it's typically at at 13 um 1310 nanometers uh, but but it doesn't have to be that's that's just the standard um but it perfectly contains that light wave traveling down that center core and and it doesn't have to rely on what multimode relies on which is this thing called total internal reflection so you know that when light passes from one um, medium to another it's bent it's refracted um but if the interface, i.e., the the, the 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 connecting plane between the two layers, um, is of sufficiently high optical characteristic difference, um, it doesn't pass from one medium into the next. It it's it's reflected, and that's how a mirror works. And and uh, and and you get this phenomenon called total internal reflection. And so, as the the diagram that I'm sort of waving my mouse on here, um, you know, a light wave hits the internal wall, bounces off, and and hits the other internal wall of the fiber, and it makes its way down the down the fiber cable, bouncing on and off, on and off the the, the walls of the fiber until it gets to the other end and it's detected. Whereas in the case of a single mode fiber, it's perfectly contained within the center core, and doesn't have to do any of that total internal reflection nonsense, and the consequence is that a single mode fiber, although the glass has to be of a much higher quality, the single mode fiber can contain a light beam for many, many more kilometers than a, than a multi-mode fiber can. A single mode fibers typically will go, uh, well, until very recently the standard was 40 kilometers before you had to regenerate the signal, before you had to put it through uh, an amplifier to bring it back up to level again. But the, the latest standards will go for 80 kilometers. And that's why, as an aside, that's why all the co-located data centers are all about 40 kilometers away from the London Internet Exchange. So if you look in Watford and you look in Slough, that's where all the co-located data centers are because that's about as far as they can be um, from the London Internet Exchange uh, on a single fiber run without having to regenerate the signal. But having said that, fibers run all the way across the Atlantic and uh, you, you, the, the way they do those, and I'm gonna pop, open, pop, pop up a picture of the, uh, of the AT&T um, ship that does um, uh, fiber um, runs across large oceans, uh, and, and the picture I'm showing is 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 of that ship um, running the most recent cable out to Iceland, and uh, and you can see it's essentially there's a, there's a, there's a cable trailing behind the ship and is uh, being guided down onto the ocean floor, and it really is that that simple. And the cable is actually manufactured on the ship. The ship trundles along, you know, manufacturing cable and laying it out in a long line. And every forty kilometers, well, they're or actually so, they're actually extruding the cable yep. as they go. Yep, they have a they have a big furnace and uh, and a big big tank of all the raw materials and they make it as they go and they put the coating on and everything else and, and every 40 kilometers they have to stop and they have to splice in a small repeater device which is powered by a nuclear pile as a little uranium pile battery <laughs> which will last for 200 years and and uh, and that's the repeater that sends the, the, the regenerates the signal and sends it on its way so that's that's where single mode fiber started and came from and and, and it really wasn't until the late 70s early 80s that people figured out you could you didn't have to be so so you you didn't have to be so precise with fiber. You didn't have to have this this perfectly manufactured, you know, very high quality fiber that perfectly contained the beam of light and would take it many tens of kilometers, um, you know, and, and and was 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 the kind of thing that only the military and you know, uh, you know, British Telecom could afford. Um, uh, in in the mid eighties, they they kind of got to grips with this idea of total internal reflection, uh, and. And rather than having to have a very high quality laser to launch the light down the down the single mode fiber, you could have a very cheap LED emitter to send the light down the light pipe. And and well, there are, there are two kinds. There's 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 LED emitters, and and and, and some sort of slightly higher end applications for multi mode use these things called V cells, vertical cavity, um, vertical cavity emitting lasers, which are basically very cheap low end LED based lasers. But either way. You, you don't need a high quality laser source to light up the, the multi-mode fiber. 
so long as you're happy with the limitation of it only going a few hundred meters right. um, and of course the other side of this is you don't just you're not just restricted on sending a single wavefront down the fiber you can send multiple wavefronts down the fiber and that's what the modes are um the, the, the there's one single path of light is a is a mode is that is there a uh well Y yes. So, so if you think about your your um, uh, fibre channel adapter in the back of your Avid workstation, which is connected to the shared storage over fibre channel, um, the little LED emitter in there can launch different, s marginally different wavelengths down the fibre, and of course, as soon as they they get into the fibre, they're they're travelling um, uh, with slightly different propagation characteristics and so they'll be bouncing down the fiber quite happily and they don't particularly interfere with each other they do a little bit but you can send you know 16 32 different light modes down that light pipe and recover them at the other end and this is why as well as now being able to manufacture the cable cheaply and being able to build very modestly priced adapters that can go in the back of a PC and that can cost a couple of hundred dollars rather than many thousands of dollars that a telco would need to launch than a single mode fiber um, you've also got the advantage of for things like sand traffic which is essentially virtualized SCSI you don't mm -hmm. need to packetize up that data stream into a single high density data stream you can just launch all 16 or all 32 data streams down the cable at once so, uh, which yeah. means you can build cheap fiber channel adapters or cheap network fiber adapters uh, and, and you can use cheap cable and you can use a very cheap uh, LED based emitter to send the signal down the cable and all of a sudden you've opened up a whole load of you know within premises applications uh, that don't rely on this very high quality very rarefied world of single mode fiber so that's that's the fundamental difference between single mode fiber and multi mode fiber now we we, we we you 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 sort of uh, sort of echoed back the the observation I'd made about um, uh, the difference between uh, sixty two point five micron and fifty micron, um, and and that's one that gets people all the time, and it's it's probably it's probably the one headache that that, that people bang up against, you know, in premises fibre wiring, um, OM one fibre, which the, the OM stands for optical multimode OM one. It was the first standard that came along late eighties early nineties. Um, uh, uh, defines the the overall width of the light pipe to be six uh, to be 125 microns, and it defines the centre core to be 62.5 microns, half of that, and and that standard stayed with us forever, and and it originally was launched as a one gigabit standard, uh, you know, for for uplinking network switches and those kind of things, but as ever, you know, these things progress, people develop better channel packing and data um, packing technologies, and currently. Quite a lot of people use OM1 fiber with eight eight gigabits per second traveling down it. That's not unusual. Um, right. You know, you, you're probably starting to get towards the limit of of how well the fiber performs at that data rate. And as every engineer knows, yeah, you double the frequency of a signal going down a cable. In essence, you have to assume that you've got twice as much signal to noise performance for the thing to perform as well, or you've got to half the distance. So these these are all octaves. These are all halvings or doublings. But generally yeah. speaking. You know, the thing was so well specified at the start that even, you know, one to two, two to four, four to eight, you know, three octaves later, the thing's still behaving well. And there are, you know, there are huge, great um, storage area networks that are running eight um, gigabits per second down OM1, optical multimode, uh, first standard fiber. Um, and there's still an awful lot of it still in use. Um, but OM1 wasn't going to last forever. And, you know, as soon as people had gigabit, they wanted 10 gigabit and... Uh, yeah. y y you know these things move on and on, and so for probably for the last five years, um, there's been a an updated standard called OM3. Now everybody says, what happened to OM2? Where did that go? There was an OM2 standard, uh, but the problem was it was neither fish nor fowl. Uh, it 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 wasn't sufficiently better than OM1 for people to retool and buy new equipment and all those things. Um, and OM1 seemed to be doing just fine, thank you very much. It wasn't it wasn't a problem. Um, so OM2 never really caught on. You still occasionally come across it, uh, but uh, as multi-mode cables go, it's it's not very pervasive at all. Not as much as okay. OM1 was, and not as much as OM3 is nowadays. So OM3 is that the 50? Uh, well, both OM2 micron. and OM3 are, are, are 50 micron standards. And you think, well, well why on earth wasn't OM2 as good as OM3? Well, what happened there? Well, um, the fundamental change between OM2 and OM3 was that. OM3 is what they call a laser optimized glass 
uh, it's it's a glass that that's equally well suited to these LED and V cell emitters that you find in 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 modestly priced uh, fiber channel adapter cards. Uh, but it's also equally equally well optimized for, for for laser. So if you do need to launch uh, high frequency um, high quality data down an OM3 fiber, it's equally well suited. Uh, whereas OM2 wasn't. OM2 was 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 V cell optimized glass only. Um, so that's why it was never really never really caught on. I've just got up another graphic here showing, uh, I suppose, the uh, a similar thing to what we saw first time round, um, except it's a it's a it's a it's a slightly more uh, enhanced picture of, of, of what the in, the inner cores of the fibre look like. Um, we can see the pure silica core, which is where the, the, the light travels, and this is true for all standards, for OS1, the single mode fibre that goes a long, long way and is very high quality. It's true for OM1 and OM3, the, the two multi-mode standards we come across, and you can see it's got the, 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 there's a, a silica cladding around that, and then and that, that typically then has a, 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 a polymide um, or aluminium uh, buffer jacket around it. And that's what the, the tiny little hair-like fibre you see when people are preparing fibres and, and things like that. So if we... Uh, is, is that... That's the whole three of them, the whole three sections we, we are seeing, isn't it? That, that's right, yeah, in, in, in cross-section. Yeah. And that, that, that's equally applicable to OM, OM3, OM1 and OS1, single-mode fibre as well, except obviously okay, the, the and, dimensions are and different. Ju and just to double-check, um, when we're talking about the, the, the diameter, the... Um, uh, the nine micron or the 62.5 or the 50 we're actually talking about the pure silica co uh, a core which is the bit we're actually measuring or, yes that's or right referring to the the, the, the bit that the bit where the magic happens where the light goes down the silica cladding yes, well, is is always yeah. 125 microns and then you've got some arbitrary amount of of buffer on top of that you know which you know yeah. nobody knows how big that is <laughs> so okay I'm, I'm just popping up now a, a picture of a, a fiber multi a multi-core cable. Now, this is a this is a confusion I often get that that people confuse single mode and multi-mode with single core and multi-core, um, and it's a you know it's, a, it's an obvious kind of confusion I suppose. But uh, the, the, the picture we've got up here at the moment shows the typical construction of what we would call a loose tube cable, a loose tube multi-core cable. Now those optical fibres contained in there, they could be single mode or they could be multi-mode. Uh, in fact, there's no way of telling. You, you have to actually look at it down the microscope or or you kind of hope that it's printed on the jacket of the cable. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, yeah, we, we've had occasions when that's not the case and you've had to get the microscope out and have a look. Um, but uh, this, this, this now brings up another point that's worth making, that the fundamental difference between uh, what we call loose tube cable and tight buffered cable, um, because that's another kind of gotcha for engineers. Um, mm. uh, tight buffered cable, and let, let me find a picture of, uh, of, of a very sort of typical sort of fiber optic patch cord. So I've, got a, a, I've popped up a picture of a fiber optic patch cord with, with the LC style of connector ends, and that's the kind of thing that might get delivered when you've purchased some, uh, some fiber based storage. Or, or maybe you've bought a couple of network switches and you need to uplink them and, and, and they're sitting next to each other in the bay. That's, that's a very typical kind of fiber optic cable that would either come with the equipment or you'd buy from your you know, IT supplier. Uh, and, and, and that style of cable is what they call tight buffered cable. It's called tight buffered because the optical cores inside the cable are, 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 are adhered um, to, the, to the inner Kevlar coating. Um, and when you bend the cable, you know that the cores inside are bending as well, they're flexing as well. And that cable is easy to manufacture, it's easy to buy ready-made pre-terminated lengths of it, but to be honest it's really only useful for um, running between equipment in a cabinet, or at most between cabinets in a machine room. It's not man enough to travel down the long distances you know, through risers, through um, you know, un under you know, raised computer floors and things like that. Uh, but you see it an awful lot. You see people, they've managed to find a company that manufactures 50 metre lengths of this stuff and they bought it and they've <laughs> pulled it in and it's working today kind of thing. Um, but it's not, it's not ideal. It's not the best solution. Um, and in fact, whenever we use it between cabinets, I've, I've popped up another picture of, of a piece of uh, a Copex sleeving that's tied mm -hmm. into the side of a cabinet. And there you, you can see coming out of that in grey are some tight buffered fiber optic patch cords and kind yeah. of that's that's our rule if we have to run this stuff between cabinets we run it in protection if we if it's just being used within a cabinet um then uh, you know it's probably safe from damage but it's not the kind of stuff you should really you know in all conscientious you know be, be running between um rooms or, or up and down risers and stuff like that 
And, and now, why is that? Is it because because it's tight bound and you go around corners, you you actually run the risk of fracturing the the inner core? Exactly. So you you've, you've brought up a very important uh, point: this idea of a minimum bend radius. That yeah. the, the, this this kind of cable, if you stress it past a certain minimum bend radius, and you can look it up on the manufacturer's website, and they'll tell you don't don't stress it past you know thirty millimeters minimum bend radius or whatever. Then, because the internal um, structure of the cable is such that the glass fiber core is adhered to the Kevlar armoring and then to the to the to the PVC jacket anything you do to the outside side the outside of the cable is being done to the glass core and it's quite easy to break the glass core um, the, the the nice thing about loose tube cable um, is that you've got the fibers and they sit inside a kind of a goopy mineral bath that's contained within a small tube and then that tube has the the, the Kevlar armoring round wound wound around it and then the whole lot is covered in a in a in a, 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 a low smoke zero halogen pvc jacket um but it's this idea of the fibers sitting in this mineral oil bath and 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 y you know you're aware of it when you chop a piece of this cable to to start ending it off or whatever you know this kind of gelatinous stuff bleeds out the end of it and 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 because the fibers sit in that in in that mineral oil bath you know, if you if you stress the cables, if you bend them round uh, round, uh, you know, a hard, uh, you know, bend in a wall or something like that, the fibres inside are able to slip and slide around and and and, and take up, uh, you know, the, the the best sort of shape to accommodate that very aggressive bend in the cable. So so loose. So if cable, you were using if you if you're using the um, uh, the the tight buffered. Uh, cable it's not just the minimum bend radius it's any tension that you might be putting on it exactly or even compression i suppose to yep. some extent you could be but more likely you're going to have problems of compression where you you pull it through a wall or put a bit of extra uh, the, the poor old um, optical fiber has nowhere to go it can just snap or not snap if you're lucky yeah and you, you, you've the... seen how brutal wildman can be sometimes you know when they're kind of pulling through some rises you <laughs> they're, know, they they're put... like a little sweethearts just in case <laughs> any are watching <laughs> you know they're, they're putting all their weight on it and dragging which is fine for coaxial cable and twisted pair audio cable etc but um but yeah yeah a yeah. tight buffered cable suffers because of that the nice thing about loose tube cable is it doesn't suffer from any of that and you know i've seen ob trucks drive over it and it's unaffected um it, it, it really is you know, it's a tiny bit more expensive than tight buffered cable, but the the total cost of ownership is tiny because it never fails. Once it's in the building, it never fails. Whereas you know that every single tight buffered long patch cord that's been slung through a facility's ceiling ducts, you know, is is going to fail at some point. It's like a hard disk. You know, it's going to fail at some point. So, yeah, <clears throat> you know, we, we we always recommend to people don't don't if you can if you can let us run this cable in. You know, the disadvantage is that somebody has to come on site with a machine and terminate it. But but the, but but the, the advantages of having a cable that you know are going to be reliable for a long time, you know, kind of can't be overstated. And and increasingly, you know, the, the, the financial model of your facility is on moving data around. It's not on on videotapes yeah. and things like that. It's 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 in the data. So so it's it's well worth spending the money. So I'm, I'm no, just, just again, I just want to um, pick up on that because you've got there is obviously a cost difference between uh, running this cable and presumably. Um, uh, the 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 loose tube is more expensive anyway than the the uh, tight buffered because it's harder to make. But also you've got to have somebody on 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 site. Could I, if I was thinking of, and I, I'm thinking now in my running a facility hat, uh, penny pinching. I've got a project. I'm only going to need it for a short time. If I run it with a tight buffered, I won't need the bloke with a thingy. It doesn't matter if it breaks in a year's time. I only need it for this one project, honestly. Um, yeah, ab absolutely. Would, is, would that be a reasonable That's thing to do? Absolutely. And there are people who make um, uh, robust tight buffered patch cables, which which kind of are are quite a nice compromise between these two things. And you know, I'd, I'd, I'd never criticise anybody for, for for wanting to do that. The th the thing about about tight buffered patch cord type cable is that. Uh, you know, for a single duplex pair, i.e., two fibres, a transmit and a receive pair, uh, it's cheaper to buy that than it is to buy. Well, you can't buy two core uh, loose tube cable; they don't just don't manufacture it. But when you get up to twenty-four cores, uh, that would be quite expensive to buy twenty-four uh, duplex patch cords and run those in. Uh, you know, by far the cheaper solution there would be, as I've got up on screen at the moment, you can see this is a, a standard LC type patch panel. And it was, it, you know, I took this photo just after the wireman had finished uh, terminating it. And you can see there are two 24 core cables coming in on the on the uh, the top left hand side there through a, through a, a plastic collet. And um, 
you know, it's all about protecting them, the, the, the fibres and making sure they don't get snagged. So, so you can see all these little plastic clips that hold them in place. And you can see uh, that they've been spliced and there's a couple of splice blocks holding them in place. And then the, the other side of that, the, the, the pre-made, pre-polished, pre-tested pigtails then take the signal out to the various patch ports. And, and once, once that's been, um, uh, you know, secured into its patch panel and, uh, and, and mounted in the bay, you know, maybe in two comms rooms at, at two ends of the facility, you know you've got 24 um, duplex circuits there that are ultimately reliable, that are going to be working in 10 years' time, and you can do with whatever you want. You might want to send video down them, you might want to send data down them, you might want to send sand traffic down them. Uh, but, you know, for people building a backbone or building an infrastructure, that's a very uh, sort of compelling argument uh, yeah. about using, um, uh, you know, loose tube cable. Yeah, and and in fact again from running facility houses you know there is no such thing as a, as a temporary short-term installation yes. if it doesn't actually go up in smoke or or, or get um, disintegrate with into dust you will use it again and again <laughs> absolutely For Book, all sorts. bookings want that one and they want another one in double double yeah. quick time you know um so so i, I suppose so, these the, yeah. these things are really about when you're designing and building a facility um you know not to not to place a, a great burden on anybody. Oh no, I I, I couldn't find a fibre guy with a fibre machine to come and do this. You know, shame on me. I use pre-made cables. Um, that's that's not the intention. But but you know, the the the, the better way is 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 to do it. You know, at the planning okay. stage. Absolutely. Um. Go on then. You, uh, I, I I can feel that you're going to tell me how on earth we connect these things together then if it, and presumably there's just a, a van load of, of of terminating specialists who respond to a, a an emergency call and they turn up well we do quite like a bit of that actually although it has to be said once we we, we i think in in the seven years that we've been doing um uh bespoke fiber now i i think we've had to go back to one or two places and they're invariably because there was one place we had to go back to where the the, the 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 riser that was carrying the, the the loose tube cable up to the edit suite um somebody had decided to hang a hang a picture um uh, and, and the, the riser was flush with the wall um and they, they, so they drove the nail through the riser cover cover and it went straight through our fiber cable and you can't you can't plan for that you know that's kind of and 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 um so it's very rare that we have to go back and repair um loose tube cable you know almost, almost never I'm just I'm just popping up some pictures at the moment of of um, of you know sort of fibre installs in process, so so yeah. so people get an idea for for you know how these things go in. Um, and at the moment I've got a picture of a of an ex colleague up, um, <coughs> who's got he's working in a bay. He's finishing off a patch panel which you can see he's he's anchored into the bay, and you can see on the on the on the shelf below him, um, a fusion splicer, and that's the, that's the machine we use to put the ends on fibre cables. And uh, if I, uh, are you seeing that same picture, Hugh? Of, of, uh, I am uh, indeed. Yes, of, of, uh, yes. Of the mighty Brian Coakley, who who used to work for me, but ah. now he's off at Prime Focus. Um, if I so if I if I pop down a couple more pictures, there's a close up of of what the fusion splicer machine looks like, um, and and essentially you look down a microscope, um, which is that black glass black eyepiece there, and uh, mm -hmm. you can see the uh, the V clamps that hold the fibers in position as you're about to splice them together and there's quite a lot of preparation involved the the small device at the bottom right of this picture labeled tritech is what they call a cleaver and that's a, a, a diamond cutter that, that that perfectly cleaves the fiber ready to be joined together so so the the end of the loose tube cable with its pigtail which is the the pre-made connector that um you know you can see so many of in in, in this picture here they're, they're yeah. orange ones so that that tells me they're om1 ones this must be quite an old picture um, so, so there's the fusion splicer machine, um, uh, you know, ready to uh, ready to start connecting those things up. And in fact, I've got another picture here, which is just taking down the eyepiece of the microscope, and and you can see it's 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 uh, if you've got it up here, it's that it's it's the uh, it's the green circular picture with a little sort of arrow point yeah. at one side. Yeah. So so the the um, the tube you can see running down, uh, you know, not quite off off center from the, where the green light is. That's the fiber once spliced. So before I press the splice button on the machine, um, that light pipe there was two light pipes. And pressing the splice button oh, right. fired the machine up, and it, it and it kind of made some measurements, and it and it butted the fibers together, and and it and it fired a uh, a, 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 a very short um, burst of, of arcing energy to to, to fuse the, the fiber together, and 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 that's after the process is finished. We can see, you know, you can't even see where the join is. Um, uh, 
I mean, if you could see where the join was, you know, it was a very bad join and it wouldn't transmit data right. very well. But there we are. You can you can see the, uh, the 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 visible part down the center there is is the is the transmissive core where the light go, yep. you know bounces down, and then the the, the 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 black or the darker area around the core is the um, is the cladding, and so that's a yep. that's a that's a nicely done fiber splice, and I would expect that to have, <coughs> you know, less than 0.1 of a dB of loss across that joint. Really? Um, which is you know exactly what you're after. You know you, you don't want much loss in your in your in your fiber um, world. What's the black snout thing sticking out? Is snout that just there, a, a that's guide? That, that, that's hmm. one of the electrodes. That's one of the electrodes that, that ah. fires the, 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 the splicing arc, and it's um you know it's a sort of a timed, controlled burst of uh, of, of of arcing energy that that melts and then and then the software in the machine you know drives the fibers together just enough for them to, to fuse together properly. It really is black magic, isn't it? <laughs> well, the, the wiremen have have a. I, I do it occasionally, so I'm not as fast as they are. But the wiremen have a uh, an expression where they say, "You've got the blindness. You've got the fibre blindness." Once you've once you've been doing a few hours worth of splicing, you know, looking down the microscope um, the whole day, uh, you get the blindness, and you can't you can't see. Uh, you know, every joint you do is a bad one, and you just have to walk away and have a cup of coffee and come back, and then you're back in action again. So, uh, if you ever hear Wyman referring to the fibre blindness, that's what they're talking about. They've kind of they've um. lost they've lost their mojo, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Okay. So, but is that something that um, you know? If I'm working in a, a facility, there's only me, but we have got you know, or a small team. Is it something I could realistically expect to be able to tool up for and do in house? Well. Um, so six or seven years ago, um, uh, the, the machines were around about the ten thousand pound mark. Um, we have two where I work um, because we have enough work to justify it. <clears throat> I don't know many. I don't know many facilities that own uh, their own fusion splicer. A couple do. I think Molinaire have just bought one actually. Um, I think the guys there told me they bought one because they do enough now, um, which means a little bit of our work has just dried up. Um, uh, but um, I think for the most part, you, you know, people are happy to hire in. A guy with a machine, and there's a few freelancers who who, who make a good living because they they own a machine. Um, in the last few years, there's been a bit of a, a sea change in the market, and the kinds of machines that we're still using are what's referred to as cladding alignment splices. So, mm -hmm. the, the 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 very precise mechanical alignment blocks uh, that bring the fibers together, uh, they align the fibers based on the on the, on the diameter of the cladding. Um, yeah. And if you had a badly manufactured fibre where the transmissive core through the middle of the fibre wasn't wasn't exactly in the centre, you'd get a bad joint every time. Um, there's a newer style of machine uh, which is called a core al a core alignment splicer, which uses uh, cameras set at right angles to actually look up the fibre while the machine's driving the fibres together to be spliced. And even with badly manufactured fibre cable, you'll get a perfect splice every time. Now those machines, when they were first launched about five years ago, were £38,000, £40,000. There was one Japanese company who cornered the mar market, uh, Fujikara, and um, mm -hmm. and those machines were considered the Rolls-Royce. And uh, those those companies that invested in them reckoned that you could knock out typically three or four times the number of splices a day than you could with a, with a, with a, a cladding alignment splicer. Um, but cladding alignment splices have fallen in price. They're they're, they're around about the three thousand pound mark now for a you know a, 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 a good known branded one like a Tritec or something like that. And yeah. uh, and core alignment splices have fallen down below the ten grand mark as well. So it's all becoming a lot more affordable. And although it's probably still out of the reach, or still out of the sensible reach of most facilities engineering departments, um, you know it's it's I know several freelancers who own their own equipment now. Um, so but if you were a broadcaster or, 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 or a large OB fleet owner, then it might be sensible to have. But certainly for a broadcaster, you could expect to find these things uh, dotted absolutely. around if there was a decent engineering team. Uh, absolutely. I mean, obviously, a lot of broadcasters now, uh, you know, farm their engineering out to other people. But you'd expect kind of Siemens in-house team to, to own, you know, one or many. Um, and... Uh, I think increasingly it'll be the way of things. You know, I, I don't think it'll be considered a specialism anymore. It'll be considered the kind of thing that anybody who's doing data cabling or or video infrastructure cabling will be expected to provide. Um, yeah, we've we've made a very good living uh, off it. You know, for in recent years. Excellent. The the um, the skill level required to to, to operate these are uh, presumably the machines are sort of becoming cleverer. So you just need to put the put the two pieces in and 
turn the on switch or something. Yeah, yeah. But well, like, like everything. Is there a great deal of skill? It's a craft skill, uh, you, you know, uh, and um, it takes you. Well, it took me a few days to kind of get good at it, and I had to, you know, go through several hundred pounds worth of sort of stock breaking things and, and doing it badly uh, before before I could get consistently good results. But you know, it, it, it didn't take too long for us to train all our best wiremen to be able to drive the machine and to be able to do all that stuff. So so it's um it's 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 accessible. And if you think back ten years before we were all using fusion splicers, um, the previous method that you'd see people terminating fibre cables was what they call a cold uh, splice method, where you'd have to take the fibre and put it in a tiny little ferrule, and you'd see you'd see the, the engineer or the technician with a polishing glass that had maybe five different grades of, of roughness on it, and you'd see him just sitting there polishing the end of the fibre, and it might take 15 minutes to prepare the end of the fibre to go into a pre-made connector. And... You know, more often than not, he might break it while he was doing that, and and it was a very expensive way of terminating cables because one man could probably terminate a dozen cables in a day, whereas now we expect one man to be able to terminate, you know, a dozen cables in an hour, and no doubt yeah. when when yeah. when uh, core alignment splices are 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 the the, the norm, uh, you know, one man will be terminating, you know, twenty or thirty or fifty. Um, ends in an hour, so it's 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 all about that sort of thing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Excellent. <clears throat> so I just wanted to make uh, mention. Sorry, on. sorry, Hugh. I'm, I'm, I'm doing no, it. go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted to make mention of the of the, of the three different contemporary styles of fibre connectors. Um, yes, that's what I was. Yeah. Okay. So 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 I'm just going to ask just that. <laughs> I've just popped up popped up on my screen uh, a picture of some uh, uh, what they call ST ends. And the ST end was the kind of the original um, uh, fibre connector that was used very extensively in the 80s and the 90s. And it looks like a little BNC connector because it's a locking connector with a metal um, ring on it uh, that can lock the cable into position. And it's a beautifully designed, beautifully manufactured little connector, but very expensive. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, you can buy uh, pre-made uh, patch cords, you know, that, that, that terminate in, in that style. Or you can buy the pigtails that you splice onto your, onto your loose tube cable in that style. But it's, it's kind of fallen out of favour. You don't really come across it very much anymore. Um, it's, it's unusual. Um, and and the, the standard that followed it, the SC connector, um, which again I've, I've popped up on my screen now, um, uh, is, has pretty much fallen out of favour as well. You come across it sometimes, but it's, it's, no, it's, it's not ubiquitous. Which um, The LC connector, which I've got up on screen now, um, is ubiquitous. Yeah. You find it on everything. And the reason is it's a very small form connector. So you can you can plug it into the back of a a card inside a computer, you know it, it fits into the same space, um uh, on a on the front of a network switch that an Ethernet cable can plug into. It it doesn't require a large amount of backplane space. It doesn't require a large amount of front panel space on a piece of equipment, and uh you know it's it's used for both single mode and multi mode. In fact, all three styles of connectors have been used for single mode and multi mode cable, um uh, and uh, and and. As I say, it's ubiquitous. It's the one you see everywhere. It's used for pretty much everything nowadays. And if I scroll back up and pop up um, the picture of, of, of one of those uh, fibre patch panels as they're being manufactured, as they're being prepared and terminated, um, uh, that there, there, that, so that's a 24-way um, LC panel. And uh, you know, for every for every 20 24-way LC panels we install, we probably install one of the other kind. Uh, that you know, it's 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 everywhere. Mm. The other thing that's worth mentioning is um, uh, you do have to deal with patch cords, of course. Uh, having sort of bad mouth long patch cords and you shouldn't use them and blah, blah, blah. Of course, if you're connecting two pieces of equipment together within a cabinet, that's what's needed. And if you're connecting your lovely, uh, you know, fibre tie lines as presented on this on this 24-way LC patch panel, which goes through to your other comms room or to your, you know, data centre down the corridor or whatever, you've, of course, you've got to use patch cords. They're, they're, they're a fact of life. And... Um, the health of patch cords can often be what kills or 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 destroys the the reliability of a data circuit, um, because you know the the, the 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 pigtails that connect to the loose tube cable are safe, safely protected inside the the, the metal panel, um, but the patch cords kind of dangle about in the bay and and the engineer disconnects it you know and reconnects it and it and it collects dust and everything else and people don't remember to put the little plastic caps back on when they're storing it and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, well, here's a, a, a handheld um, 
uh, fibre microscope for inspecting the ends of patch cords. This is not an expensive piece. This is about £150. This one's manufactured by uh, JDSU, a Japanese company. And, um, you know, that's just a handheld, battery-powered fibre microscope. And you can see on the, on the right-hand side there, in front of the eyepiece, there's a knurled knob which you can focus with. And it's just perfect for inspecting the ends of patch cords to seeing if, if they're still in a usable state. And, and here is a, a photograph taken down that microscope. And I'm looking at the um, we're looking at the end of a of an LC connector here, and the big white um, uh, piece that that occupies most of the image is the cladding, yeah. and 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 the and the darker grey piece in the middle is is the that transmissive core, and you can see we've got a big bit of grot on the cladding, which isn't important because the cladding's not carrying any of the light energy, any of the power, but we've also got a little bit of grot on the core. And that will scatter the light. That will compromise the patch cord's ability to reliably carry that 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 light signal. Uh, and so the thing we uh, the thing we use to clean that off with is this device here. It's called a, a Cletops, and it's a uh, it's a it's a preloaded cassette system where um, you just swipe the, uh, the 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 end of the patch cord along this soft um, fabric piece here which is preloaded with a with a with an isopropanol um, detergent and that that does the job beautifully and just one swipe and, you, and your patch cords back and ready for use and in fact you know this is a, such a good system that it's probably worth you know if you've got several patch cords in your machine room it's probably worth having one of those in the in the uh, machine room drawer and uh, just when you think there might be a problem it's worth cleaning off the ends of the patch cords um, but uh, that's that's the kind of thing that you see when you see a dirty patch cord. In fact, that's not not too bad that one. It's got a bit of grot on it, but uh, but not very much grot at all. Um, so um, uh, I wanted to now sort of go into the the sort of the the, the things that uh, sort of trip people up and and some of just the the the, the engineering points that are worth you know making. Um, uh, you know, for the jobbing engineer who's kind of thinking about, well, you know, we've got different bits of fibre equipment, and and and, you know, how how do I how do I how do I equip myself, you know, for some rudimentary fault finding and things like that. Now, back to the um, the picture of the of the LC patch cord, and you'll see that that that, that, that there's two there's actually two fibre connectors at each end, yeah. uh, and we refer to that as a duplex patch cord. The, the, you know, and typically if that was carrying um, traffic for a storage area network, so from your Avid Unity or your Apple XSAN down to your editing workstation um, one of those cores will be carrying the transmit side of the of the of the of the data and the other is the receive side so so one is data from the the sand to the, the workstation and the other one is data the other way around and in fact if you cup your hands around the, the the end of the fiber patch cord with the little plastic covers removed you can see one of the cores will be lit up and the other core will be dark and that's because one core is carrying data from one piece of equipment to the other and the other core would be plugged into a light source. So expecting something to come yeah, down. So yes. when, you, when you plug the patch cord up, you're hopefully plugging light to dark and dark to light. You know, that's the way it works. Now, the strange thing is that patch cord manufacturers, they have no standard for whether the patch cord is, is A to A or A to B, whether it's a crossover patch cord or a straight, you know, side to side patch cord. And the reason for that is that some applications demand a crossover patch cord and some applications demand a straight A to A, B to B patch cord. Um, if you've got a fibre channel switch in the system, that assumes an A to A, B to B patch cord. If you're going from, uh, say, uh, like so something like a Facilis Terablock server to the back of a workstation, because that's a host bus adapter to a host bus adapter, it assumes a crossover, a bit like Ethernet. Yeah. If you're going computer to computer with Ethernet, you have to have a crossover cable. If you're going Ethernet switch to workstation, it's a straight pin-to-pin -pin cable. And so that, that often trips engineers up. The, the, the fact that they've either got, gone and got a crossover cable out of, the, out of the store, or that's what's been delivered, but they needed a straight cable. Or they needed a crossover cable and they picked up a straight cable. And there's no standard for it. It's ridiculous. You know, it's never marked on the bag. All you can do is, is hold the, the cable up and have a look. Because generally speaking, they at least put a different colour of, of, uh, of um, a boot on, on one side of the cable. But apart from that, there's no way of telling. Um, so I can see on this cable that they have a white and a yellow boot and so it's right. identified. Yeah. But, but 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 the number of times I've sort of gone into edit suites where they've replaced the patch cord on the back between the wall box and the back of the edit workstation, and suddenly the the connection isn't working anymore, and it's just because it's not a crossover cable when it was before, or vice versa. 
And the way to do that is to carefully remove the patch cord from the back of the uh, of the of the editing workstation from the piece of equipment. Have a look at the f uh, at, at the laser light as it emits from the at the back of the card. Cup your hand around the the, the uh, patch cord that you've got, and just see: are, Am I plugging light to light <laughs> or light to dark? Because I really want yeah. to be plugging light to dark. <coughs> Now, if you find you've you've got the wrong kind of patch cord, not all is lost, um, because the the little retaining piece um, that holds the two LC connectors to to each other is very easy to is easy to separate, and it's easy to take them apart, swap them around the other way, and put them back together again. Most, oh right. Okay. Most engineers don't bother to put the retaining piece back on again. They just now have two flappy loose ends of of LC, but at least they can now very quickly plug light to dark and dark to light. On the back of their piece of equipment, and they're back up and running again. So that's the first kind of gotcha that that a jobbing engineer should be aware of. That, that not all patch cords are created equal. Interesting. The, the next thing to be aware of is you can't mix and match um, different standards of fibre. Um, obviously, single mode and multi mode operate in entirely different ways. You know, single mode uses that well-contained beam that goes down the centre of the core. Multi-mode uses the total internal reflection where the light waves bounce down the internal walls of the fibre. So they don't work together. But more than that, you can't mix and match sing, uh, OM1, 62.5 micron fibre, with OM3. <coughs> because when you plug the OM1 patch cord into the OM3 jack field, or vice versa, you've got core sizes that are different. And so that total internal reflection as it passes through into the patch cord <coughs> an awful lot of the light disappears you know out of the out of the yeah. bits of glass that weren't matched together and you typically get two and a half dbs of loss every time you do that wow okay so if you had very very low data rate traffic like a one gigabit connection you could get away with that once you could do that once you could use one wrong patch cord and you might still be getting a decent data stream but for anything more elaborate than that you can't mix and match om3 and om1 uh, infrastructure and so generally speaking, whenever you go into a facility and you're having to add fibre, the first question is to ask the chief engineer, are you an OM1 or an OM3 house? What, what is your fibre standard? Um, and hopefully if they've kind of got mixed standards, they know exactly where they are and they're using them for different things because you can't mix and match OM3 and OM1 patch cords with OM1 and OM3 infrastructure cabling. Now, supposing um, somebody doesn't know what the cables are, is there a way of identifying them? Is there a way of noticing which is OM1 or which is OM3? Well, uh, pretty much patch cords are normally labelled, and they might be labelled OM1 or OM3, uh, or, or, or they might be labelled 62.5 stroke 125 for OM1, 62.5 yeah. microns for the core, or for OM3, 50 <coughs> stroke 125. Um, and there's some standardisation on colour. So OM1 pretty much for a long time was orange cable. Yeah. Uh, OM3 was was uh, a, a cyan cable, uh, kind of a, a nice blue cable. And OS1, yeah. single mode cable, is the yellow cable, which I've just popped up on screen there. Although yeah. that's by no means uh, consistent, and you come across grey patch cords of all three standards, and you come across um, orange patch cords of the OM3 standard. So that's it's not reliable. The best thing to do is go and look at the the, the, the writing on the jacket. And and it'll either say fifty stroke one two five, or it'll say OM three. That's one standard. Or it'll say sixty two point five stroke one two five, or OM one. That's the other standard. And you can't mix and match. If you uh, are still not sure, can you check it out with a microscope? Um, well, you can put your fibre microscope to it, and you can tell, for example, that the, the image that we popped up earlier to show the bit of grot on the end of the fibre cable. Yeah. Um, that's, we, we can tell by visual inspection that that's OM3 because the, the 50 micron core is quite obviously smaller than half of the size yeah. of the cladding. And a 62.5 micron core would be noticeably bigger than that. Yeah. Um, so that's that's one way of doing it, you know, if you're in the habit of carrying one of these lovely microscopes around with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's, so, the, go on. that's gotcha number two. Don't mix and match your standards. Absolutely. And uh, yes, and if you're not sure, um, get somebody with a microscope. And if you're still not sure, I suppose the best thing you can do is fire some, uh, some light down it and measure what comes out at the end. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Use it using using a, 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 an optical response tester, which is not an expensive piece of equipment. Typically, well, it's £500. So a bit more than your multimeter, but 
but um, you, you know, again, it's uh, well, it's an awful lot more expensive than just throwing that patch cord away and buying another one that's got the correct lettering on it. Um, yeah. But uh, you, you know, um, and gotcha number three is 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 diagnosing faulty cables. So the picture I've popped up here is of a faulty um, pigtail splice. Now. I don't know if you can see, can see that picture, Hugh, but in the right in the middle, there's a tiny red dot in the middle of the splice protector. Is that kind of obvious uh, to you? Hang on, which one am I looking at? Um, uh, okay, I, I, I may I may not have put this in your. In, uh, oh no, I should have done. They, 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 there should be a uh, like a, a big blue splice protector and a, and, a, and, a, and a white pigtail coming out of it. And, Got it. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I'm looking at the right one. Yeah. So can you see in the middle of the splice protector? There's a tiny red dot. Yeah. That tiny red dot is the output, and you'll like this, is the output of, of one of these little cheap £10 keychain laser pointers, the kind of thing you can buy from Maplin for a tenner. Yeah. And, and for me, it's one of the best bit of fibre diagnostic tools I've got because it allows me to um, light up a fibre and wherever there's a faulty splice or even, even a kink in the fibre, and it, this even works through the cladding of the cable, you see the light spilling out, and you you see um, you you see the light showing you where that faulty splice is, and you know you can kind of put aside all your kind of fancy optical time domain reflectometers. You know this <laughs> this is just a fantastic way of very quickly seeing have I got a faulty splice at this end of the cable? Because the perennial problem with with with, with, with terminating fibres is that you you terminate a whole panel's worth, you then test them all, and you discover you've got a couple of dodgy splices. And you know, you know that if you if you chop the pigtails at this end and remake them, the, the dodgy splice was at the other end, and you haven't got the time or the inclination to go and pick up the the OTDR tester, which is a very expensive piece of equipment. Uh, so what do you do? Well, the cheap and easy and quick way of doing it is using your little Maplin keychain laser pointer, pointing that down the cable, and and it's it's startlingly effective at showing up uh, bad splices. And it even works with patch cords. Even if a if a patch cord has been kinked and it's not obvious to you, you can do exactly the same thing and you'll see the red glow breaking through the the, 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 the uh, PVC cladding of the cable. <clears throat> so that's my kind of third tip to engineers. You know, yeah. if, if, if you want to quickly diagnose broken fibres, be they patch cords or be they spliced cables, little £10 uh, Maplin uh, laser torch <laughs> and, and you're off to the races. Fantastic. So that's a pretty handy... Um thing for your kit bag so you don't have to have multi hundreds pounds worth of kit just one laser pointer yeah, yeah. Uh, gives you a quick look but it is about looking after the stuff these these uh, patch cords i hadn't you know you, you don't necessarily have to have a hundred pounds worth of uh, magnifying glass you really want to keep those lenses clean though uh, you're you're dealing with optics what happens if you get dirt into your patch panel you picked up a grubby bit you put it in that's much harder to clean because you it, can't it just wipe that. So, well, let, let, let me let me scroll back up to a. a, a so, so I've popped up a picture now of a of a, of a of a panel that's yet to be closed up and, and, and installed into the bay, uh, but you can see that the pigtail, which is the piece that gets spliced onto the end of the loose tube cable, um, uh, is is just a um, it's just an LCN. That's all it is, ah, and the coupler that it sits in really is just a mechanical alignment piece so that when you plug in the patch cords the two LCNs are, are perfectly married together and they touch each other and, and that light beam can, can go straight across that junction with minimal interference. So if you suspect you've got a lossy junction on your on your panel, the thing to do is to use your Cleetops cleaner that gadget which I'll pop up again um, yeah. and, and, and use that to clean, you know, to so, so remove the the the, um, the pigtail and use the cleatops to, uh, to 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 clean that off. Generally that speaking, sense. though, <coughs> we 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 find that patch panels protect the fibres very well, and 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 it's not really an issue. Do you ever get uh, problems with patch panels uh, wearing? I mean, they're not they're not used a huge amount, but you are relying on a mechanical connection to get uh, a perfect. Uh, coupling. There. Yes, yes, you and are, it's, and it's very small. Yes, you are, and, and and they are just made out of plastic. They're stamped out of plastic. There's been a few occasions where we've had to go and replace these couplers, but they're very easy to do so. Two screws and and a, and a press of the spring piece there, and it and it releases very quickly, and uh, you know, and it's a and it's a kind of a one pound fifty part to replace. So, so uh, if you find that a patch cord isn't clicking in nicely into a patch panel, um, not all is lost. It's 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 very it's trivial to replace that piece. Okay. That's cool. 
Um, there was only one more thing I wanted to talk about, Hugh, um, and, and that's sort of some, some of the things that are coming down the pipe in terms of, of the future. And um, yeah. the big development in, in multi-mode technology is, is this thing called uh, graded index fiber. <coughs> now, you mentioned this before. This is, this is where you don't have a sharp cutoff between the, the, the optical core and, uh, and the cover surrounding it. That, that, that's exactly right, yeah. And, and so if you imagine traditional multi-mode cable, the way that behaves, you've got a, a, a light wave front traveling down the cable, bouncing off the internal walls. And literally the photons sort of slam into one wall and they, and they get pushed back down the other way. And every time that happens, some of that photonic light energy is converted into heat. It's just a matter of physics, and, and a bit of energy is lost, and 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 the and the beam loses some of its impetus. And were you to analyse the the, the 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 rising and falling edge of the data as they came out the cable at the other end, the the edge is getting a bit smeary and a bit a bit less reliable. And by the time you get to five hundred metres, you know you can't really reclock that edge. You can't really recover the data. Uh, and it's all down to the fact that the the beam is losing energy as it slams into the walls of the fibre, making its way down the cable. So. The thinking is, if you could make uh, uh, the core not of a consistent optical characteristic, but of a variable optical characteristic, such that the beam didn't follow that that sort of sawtooth pattern, mm -hmm. but was slowed gracefully into the into the cladding ah. wall, and, and 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 bent off as a sine wave, which is a very natural, very energy efficient shape. And if you can do that, so you get the beam travelling down as a wave rather than mm -hmm. slamming into the wall, slamming into the next wall, slamming into the wall, losing energy at every transition, you can minimise that loss of energy in the walls of the, of the internal transmissive core to the degree that, you know, cable that could carry the, 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 the signal maybe 500 metres can now do several kilometres and you're starting to get into the, the oh. province of, of single mode cable but with all the advantages, all the benefits of multi-mode cable. Um, so Although graded index fiber isn't really with us yet, it will be very soon. Uh, the, the standards are sort of being ratified, and, and equipment manufacturers are all kind of lining up to produce equipment that supports it. So graded index fiber will, will, will you, you know, is, is the next thing you know coming down the pipe. And is that likely to be fifty micron as well? So it'll work with the patch panels. I'm not sure. In all likelihood, <coughs> yes. Um, but uh, undoubtedly, the outer core will be 125 microns. That's what governs, you know, how all this stuff works. Uh, but yeah. I don't know whether the inner core will be a 50 micron core, whether it'll be smaller. Don't, I don't know. Presumably, it's all to do with the manufacturing process and how reliable they can make it for given core sizes. Um, yeah. But uh, but but uh, no, we'll have to wait and see for that. I mean, it's a, it's an interesting interesting times to, uh, to to be in for sure. Yeah. So it's not to be it's it's not something that's to be frightened about. Um, using fibre is. Um, Obviously, it's something you can't really avoid now. We're shifting large amounts of data. You can't do it over copper efficiently. You are going to have to use fibre. Um, you may have to get to know your local man with a splicer. Um, but apart from that, and having to go to the bar with him just to keep him sweet, Phil, um, <laughs> uh, the, the, the key things to remember, really, are um, when you're specking uh, the stuff, try and go for loose tube, not tight buffered. Um, you're going to be with OM3 anyway, so that's not a problem. But do check before you go into uh, uh, connecting up your old fibre with your new what you are connecting, because you're going to lose an awful lot of information. Well, it's just not going to work, really, yeah. there. And is there a way of looking at it and saying, is this loose tube, is this tight buffered? If, if you've inherited an installation where somebody has, has used tight buffered and you don't want it, how would you know by looking at it? Well, t t tight buffer cable looks very much like a patch cord. So oh, it's, fair enough. Of course, it does. Yes. You know, it, it, the, the construction is, is different, um, and whereas loose tube cable actually looks like a bit of Cat Five. It, it, it looks yeah. like a, just a regular bit of data cable. And and the, the nice thing about loose tube cable, and I think I alluded to it earlier, is that you know you can buy it with just four cores, or you can buy it with forty eight cores, and it's no yeah. bigger. So so if you've got to run, if you've got to run forty eight cores, i.e. i.e. a set of twenty four pair duplex pairs for two twenty four way patch panels. That's just yeah. a single cable run. Uh, you know, try doing that in type buffer cable. You know, that's that that would be yeah. that would be twenty four cables you'd have to pull through the duct, and how many of those would work by the time you got to the other end? So, so fibres of and, and and the step change in cost between a four core cable and a forty eight core cable is maybe twice as much. It's not it's not an order of magnitude. You know. So if you're planning an installation, definitely go for more. 
absolutely silly not to really so i mean just just i suppose by, by way of a, a sort of a little sort of story to finish um uh, we were doing a build last year and uh, we discovered that our supplier had supplied or they, they'd run out of eight core fiber which was the the, the the fiber we'd specified for all the edit suites but they let us have 24 core fiber for a tiny bit more and we didn't think twice about running 24 core fiber into all the edit suites even though they will never in a month of sundays use 24 cores but, yeah we left 16 of the cores fallow in the wall box unterminated and yeah. uh, you know if their chief engineer ever comes to me and says oh phil i need to get some more fibers into edit three i'll go let me tell you something um you know and it's just it's not a problem to run more cores and we we normally run more cores than we've even told the customer that we run because yeah. you know when they come back to you in a year's time it's it's trivial to go and re-terminate some more fibers yeah. you know compared to the cost of getting a guy in and getting the ceiling down or getting the floor up and all that nonsense fantastic that's really interesting and uh, and it's not as scary as as you might have thought if you're a, a copperhead like i once was Ab absolutely i mean you know uh, i i think there is less complexity in all this stuff than there is in the subtle differences between different kinds of copper cable and you know i think i think the skills are very comparable and i think it's i would inc i encourage all engineers to kind of get their head into this because if you don't have to this month you, you know you're kind of lucky it's it's yeah. it's going to be on yeah. us all soon well most interesting that fantastic thank you Jolly good. Well, uh, thank you, Hugh. I'm going to pop your uh, your website back up again, and uh, and and say that uh, uh, you know I'll I'll put a, a lower third on showing your uh, your Twitter address, and I'm popping up my website, my uh, my technical blog, which is uh, all this nonsense. You can find all that there as well, and uh, and just say thank you very much, Hugh. Again, it's been a, it's been a pleasure, and uh, we'll do it again soon. Yeah, looking forward to the next one. Jolly good. Catch thank you later. You. Bye bye. Bye bye.